is this? So why don't we just start with checking in, like, where are you in your day? Tell me about a place where uh, you were, I'm gonna really ask this question. You were awake today. Like you saw something like, huh, isn't that interesting? You had a wakefulness or a moment of attention. I am the metaphor woman. My moment of attention was 5 a.m. until about, um, let's see, 6 p.m. roughly. Okay, Mr. Literal, we'll take it. Last night after the session meeting, um, Mackie Johnson, I don't know if y'all know who Mackie is. She is Leanne Rames' mother, but she has been really challenged by the fact when we put up the Black Lives Matter sign. And so um, we have traded phone calls around this for many, many, many days. And she called last night after the session meeting, like we had this point of connection. And our conversation, once I told her that the money we spent, the sign that we put up that was not money that we gave to the Black Lives Matter organization. She just like, she turned a corner and she was like, oh, wow, okay. Hey, have you seen? And she, uh, she told me about the story that's on Amazon Prime about the Fren a French, it's like the story of from France in World War II. It's some drama. And I was like, no, I hadn't heard of that. Anyway, I went and looked it up last night and asked me how much of it I watched. <laughs> so my wakefulness was kind of through the night because Mackie Johnson introduced me to a new Amazon Prime kind of show. And I like got hooked immediately and was binge watching in the middle of the night. So that was my wakefulness. Hey, Marjorie. And I'm not really a binge watcher of such things. So it was kind of interesting. And it's subtitled, so you really have to concentrate. So I think my brain got engaged late at night and there I was. What did you say it was? We had children running around. What was the name of it? Uh, let me tell you because I can't remember. Hold on a second, oh. I'm gonna look it up. Because I didn't sleep a lot last night. I was watching a something. A French village. Y'all don't judge me if you go watch it. <laughs> A French village. So anyway, I learned something new. It was kind of a wakeful kind of thing for me. Hey, Marjorie. Well, it's not, it wasn't today, but my wakefulness weekly, Anne, is always um, 6 a.m. in the parking lot when it's still dark and Ben's truck pulls up at Idlewild and we start loading that thing up. That's my moment of wakefulness sure. every single week. I'm there he is. See him leaning in. Yeah. Don't hide, Ben. No, I'm I'm here. Won't be that. No, no, I agree. I think that that that's among the highlights of my week every week. Just because it's it's tangible. It's tech. It, it's it's there in front of you. You've accomplished something uh, meaningful, you know, uh, in your week. So, yeah, I agree. Definitely meaningful. It's connective tissue. It's a wakefulness that makes, I mean, I think for those of us in the parking lot early, it makes you feel like you're connected. You can even see stars in the sky. Right. And the occasional bat or 100 bats. <laughs> we definitely see those, don't we? Whitney, I can't hear you. I was catching Kevin up on what we were talking about. And I said, I don't have anything. <laughs> Trying real hard to think. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Marjorie, how did the... Uh, Youth Summit go tonight. You want to? These are the people who will have youth in the program shortly. You want to tell us anything about it? 
It was very encouraging and there are lots of good ideas and lots of energy about what the youth program is going to become in its new iteration. Um, and at the end, they were supposed to dream big, but yet turn those big dreams into SMART goals. And, you know, some of the parents that were present are really good at SMART goals. You can tell they do it for their job because they were real concise. Jason Wolf kills who I'm talking about. Anyway, but some of the parents. <laughs> it was funny because they were supposed to be assigning numbers of children or numbers of youth to these goals. And they would say 30, 60, and finally I'd had enough and I raised my hand because I was really trying to not talk because anyway. And um, I said, y'all need to think bigger. I said, you have 127 youth on your roll right now. And I have double that under the age of four. So y'all need to be putting your goals of like 120 participate. <laughs> it was good. So, so tonight is the, tonight and tomorrow are this vision summit as we vision what youth ministry is going to look like moving forward. And if any of y'all are coming to worship on Sunday, I think we may have a candidate for our youth ministry position that will be uh, practicing Wade into worship. Uh, I mean, she will be coming to worship at Wade into worship on Sunday, though it does look like it's going to rain on Sunday. Look, yeah. Does she want to help me do the Energizer? <laughs> Maybe. No. She... Will, will she be staying potentially through uh, 11 a.m. worship or just for the Wade into worship portion? You know, I don't have that. I don't have the answer to that yet. All right, so now I'm really gonna to try to share my screen. We're really gonna talk about Advent. So started with like, can you tell me about a moment of wakefulness? Because um, Advent is a time of kind of being wakeful, of being present. And so let's see. And um, I need visual images, y'all. So where I want us to start tonight, wakefulness is because that's our first week of Advent's theme is wakefulness. But what I want to do tonight is I kind of think of, I want to kind of model some practices I think you could do. So my invitation to us is, um, I am, this is O Come, O Come Emmanuel, which is probably uh, the strongest Advent hymn. And so for us as adults, I just want to listen to this together. And so my invitation is to put your feet on the ground or find yourself in a comfortable place. And I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath and hold it for a minute and then let it go. And we're going to go one more, take another breath. and then let it go. And then one more. And then let it go. for me tonight. Okay, we're not gonna do that. <clears throat> so Pentatonix has uh, has the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. My internet is unstable and I'm not able to share it with you right now. But it's a acapella version of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And I think it's a great place to start. And it's a hymn that we will hear in Advent at Idlewild. It's where we'll start Advent in worship. So I was gonna start us there, but I can't because of my internet. So we're just gonna keep moving. So, so this, I just wanna give just a little background about what we're doing at Idlewild this year for Advent. Um, Sanctified Art are a group of young theologians who are also artists and they did our Lent um, kind of coloring pages that were in the bulletin. Um, and so this year they've put together a series called Those Who Dream. 
And the themes on the purple are for each week of Advent. So the first week of Advent is keep awake and hope. The second week of Advent is prepare the way and peace. And then the third week is so joy and joy. And then the fourth week is you are not alone. So that's like the incarnation of Christ. You know, you are not alone because love divine dwells among us. And so these hope, peace, joy, and love, for those of you who came to the Advent workshop, those are the four um, candles that will light, um, that you can light. And so, um, what I want to do is just kind of go through each week and y'all to be, to be truthful, this book, Whitney, do you know this book? I wish we'd had this book when we were young parents. It's uh, by Tracy Smith and um, Faithful Families for Advent and Christmas. And she talks about in it, um, you know, put it up with your Christmas decorations. So every year you pull it out. <laughs> but they're good practices throughout it for depending on, you know, it's really Jenna, y'all have, Jenna and Jeremy have the oldest kid. Well, maybe not. Y'all have the oldest children, right? In this group. Yeah. So, um, but it gives kind of a, a range of uh, activities to participate in. So anyway, moving on. This is what I want to know. Who here practiced Advent when you were growing up? So tell me what you remember about your own family um, and what your practices were. Whitney, would you start? Well, I guess we didn't really do it at home other than light the candle, the Advent wreath occasionally, but I remember doing it at church mostly, but it wasn't the same like we do now. I mean, it was sort of an, I remember when Advent became a thing. Like I remember when, like I remember it was different and we were like, oh, this must be Episcopalian. <laughs> we didn't so, know. So the, the practice felt ritualistic in some way. Yes. Is that what you're making it by Episcopalian? Yes. The ritual well, that, think that we knew before. that like, um, we knew our friends at Grace St. Luke's did it. And so that's why we probably went there. Emily. What'd y'all do? So I was thinking of two things. And one of them was um, I went to Catholic schools growing up and um, I was reminded actually of their Advent practices recently because I went to, I did a, a Zoom talk about mindfulness to the Holy Rosary PTO last week. <laughs> and they were planning for, um, how they were going to modify Advent for the kids at Holy Rosary. And a lot of the weird, you know, weirdly, the, all of that has slipped my mind, but when they were talking about it, it was all familiar again. Um, and just about the ways that they were going to have to modify the different age groups and the all school masses and the kind of um, charity events that they traditionally do during the time of year. But the other thing that I think of, um, and I noticed that your PowerPoint is all purple. Um, my, uh, when I was a kid, my mom, for the most of the time when I was growing up was um, the director of liturgy at our parish. And so she was really involved in um, changing the sanctuary and um, even just turning over um, all of the symbolism of the season. Um, you know, things that we used on the altar and with communion and the priest's vestments and the uh, books that were used and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so those are kind of the first two things. We didn't, although we made the Advent wreath at school, we didn't really celebrate in that way at home, but it was definitely part of my school life, which is funny, um, and church life. Anybody else? 
So I grew up at Balmoral Church, which is <clears throat> out on Quince Road, and they had a huge chrismon tree. And uh, we made those ornaments and we made them one year early in the life at Balmoral. And they were made out of that like crunchy white styrofoam. And then we wrapped it with fabric or ribbon and used pins. And so like, I remember the tactile, I think the adults cut the patterns out. Like maybe we traced the patterns, but at church we cut those out and then we hung them on the tree together. And that was actually an event that happened at church. But, um, but it became a ritual every year. We got to hang those things. We made them one year, but we, I, I don't even know if Balmoral still has these. But um, they could because that plastic will last forever. But um, that is that is really the only practice I remember from Advent as a child growing up. Um, we didn't do anything in my home with my parents. So those are kind of my memories. <clears throat> so, so this is um, Tracy Smith. Um, suggest just starting. And Marjorie at the Advent Crafts Workshop um, created a um, like a list of, of weekly by week prayers for Advent as you light the Advent candle. So that's this is the first. This is the preparatory prayer. And so I wonder what it looks like to just um, you know one of the things that Tracy Smith says is just make it simple. Advent is a time of preparation. Um, and, you know, at the heart is we're waiting and we're hoping for Jesus Christ Advent into this world. So what's that look like? You know, and how do you do that in a simple way with our at home? How do we practice at home? I've, I've told um, Marjorie, one of the things I am just stunned by wade into worship that worship service when I walk past the blankets and where um, those who are gathered are working with the craft when you're working with the craft to hear you talking to your children about what you're doing together that modeling of how to connect a story from scripture to a, to a tangible thing and then imagining what that's like that is one of the most profound things I've seen in ministry in terms of forming faith of families together, because you can pick that whole thing up and you can take it into your home. I don't know if you do, but I think you can. And, and I've, I've like, I've never seen that this, I've been in this job for about 20 years, but I've not seen that modeled in a similar way in the church. So it's a really exciting thing. And so y'all are the group <laughs> You know, the parents of young children are the one that brought that idea to us. Like, let's just kind of wade into worship and, you know, give us, help us to teach our children. So anyway, that's, I'm going aside. So, um, so here's the simplicity of the season. I wonder what it looks like to gather your family and start with this um, opening prayer. Um, and now, like, here's my suggestion as I was imagining this and took this off of Marjorie's list for y'all. I could imagine like building a tent under the dining room table. I don't know if y'all have dining room tables, but I wonder about creating a special space where you, where you can be like, you're, you're at the beginning of something new. And so you create a space for that newness. And so I wonder, so in my mind, if I had children that were still at home, I might think about, could we uh, make a tent on the dining room table, get under that and pray this prayer. So um, Megan, you want to read it for us? Sure. As we wait for the birth of Jesus, we pause and think about we want what we want the season to be. A season of hope, a season of peace, a season of joy, a season of love, a season of family togetherness, a season of reflection. So... I wonder if you were under, so I'm just imagining, and if you think making a tent under the dining room table doesn't work for you, but maybe there's a space in your house where you can create a special place. But I wonder if you're there while you're there at the beginning of this new season, together as a family, you set an Advent intention. This is one thing we're going to do together during the season we call Advent. We're at the beginning of it. And, um, 
you know, I just, I'd like to hear like, what could that look like? Could it be, we're going to, um, once a week, we're going to get into this tent under the table and we're going to wonder about hope or we're going to wonder about love or we're going to wonder about joy. But every Sunday we're going to do an Advent practice together. So I might wonder what that might look like. Um, you know, and I'm struck by um, just thinking about the season that we're in, just everything is, we're, we're all just stuck in our homes. Um, you know, most of us on this call have children that are virtual schooling and we're just in this, this space all the time, thinking about how we can make the space that we're in all the time into something new and wonderful because of the season that we're entering, entering liturgically. Um, the tent on the dining room table is an amazing idea. I love it. If my body will allow me to contort myself in such a way that I can get in the tent. Um, what would it look like if you got stars and you put them up underneath? Now I don't want to defame your uh, your table, but what if you put stars on the underneath of the table? You know, about the outdoor table, yeah. <laughs> Barbara Brown Taylor tells the story about, um, she was very connected to her father. She's an Episcopal priest, but she talks about um, stargazing with her father, like going out, um, what a privilege it was um, when it was dark. And sometimes it was early in the morning before the sun came up or at night after they'd been to bed, but their father, her father would um, wake them up and take them outside and spread out a blanket and say, I want you to see the canopy of the stars. I want you to see the wonder that is before you and just like looking up at the stars in the night sky. Um, it's the other piece that ties us into the season of epiphany that kind of makes me wonder if at the beginning of Advent, you could plant some seeds for the stars in, and the star that the Magi follow. Um, so that could be kind of interesting. You could cut out stars during the course of Advent. Um, so I think I would be curious to think about just as adults thinking about how do we set, how do we set an intention for what we're going to do? Not a making us more busy, but just like, let's think about what we can do as a family, you know, if it, and it can be as simple as just once a week, let's do something together. Let's meet under the dining room table or. So the first, um, Sunday in Advent is waiting in wonder, keep awake, hope. And so um, on the, in the purple is what's, what Marjorie has provided in the um, Advent candle lighting. And so what does it feel like to wait? What does it mean to have hope? What do you think about when you hear the word hope? How do we share hope with others? Um, and then there's a prayer that you pray. You would, I, we light this candle for hope. I don't know if you want to light a candle under your table, but you know, our, in our family, when our kids were younger, we never could get that an, Advent candle lighting thing done. You know, we were, I don't know. We just couldn't find a time in our family to do it. Uh, I don't know if it was because it was so chaotic at mealtimes, like just getting the meal to the table. So as I, that's the cat coming in to say hello, y'all. Um, but I think, I, I wonder if Jim and I had said, let's set an intention about when we're gonna do this, if we would have, it would have been better for us. So anyway, that's my only thing. Um, so this is the create a sacred place. So where would this look like in your home? So I have suggested under the dining room table. I wonder what y'all might think about if you were to create a sacred space, what might that look like? I want to hear from y'all. I can say we've, oh, go ahead, Jeremy, please go. Uh, I like the idea of the kids creating the sacred space. So the idea of a, a, um, a fort under the dining room table or a fort in the playroom or a fort in the piano, just somewhere, 
somewhere in the house that the kids have created. Um, so they're actively involved in, in creating the, the space that they understand, or maybe they don't understand, but they will understand as they create it is the space that will be used for, for hope, for anticipation, for these things. So I like the idea of the kids creating the space. Mm -hmm. That appeals to me. Emily, were you going to say something? I was going to say that the, um, the fort building game in our lives lately has been extraordinarily strong. Uh, and I think that that is in part because of something that's already been said that, you know, we're in our home for virtual schooling and all of the things um, when we're not outside, we're in our home. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's, I feel like there's right now a constant reimagining of spaces in my house and people claiming different spaces for different projects and things. Um, and so in, in a way, it seems like a less, it, like it, it seems like a less sacred concept, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. to where to where I might have to. I I almost was thinking, can I make a diorama or something, <laughs> like something that we don't get in, but something that's more along the lines of what maybe Marjorie makes with the little wonder set. Mm hmm. Like a shadow box of sorts. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see you. Um, Whitney, Kevin. So last year we tried to do something that didn't go over so well, and I hope to be able to do it again. And our sacred space looks, because my personality is very different of climbing under the table, but um, we have, <laughs> we can't fit under there. Um, we have special, almost you would call it sacred Christmas china that um, that we have. And last year we started and tried to make, because we don't all eat together very well right now because everybody's just everywhere. Um, and we tried to all be together and sit down and eat off of like our fancy china and make that be a point of what, that was when we lit on Sunday evenings, that was when we lit our wreath. Um, it didn't, we, we might we, we might have done it once, <laughs> but the intention was there. And so I hope that we will be able to do that again or try to make that go a little bit further. They're very interested in, they're very interested in what that China is and what it looks like. And so I hope that that's something that we can do with them and do those readings then. Mm -hmm. We might build a tent too, <laughs> but we have lots of tents in our house right now. It's very strong. <laughs> I'm missing the tent building in my house. Okay. Megan, would you add anything or Marjorie? Um, so two things that one that worked well last year um, for us was just lighting. We had an advent wreath that we made together and um, we lit a candle every night at dinner. And it became something that like, it, it wasn't about, we, we couldn't forget about it. Like the kids, like the girls would make sure, oh no, we can't have dinner until we light this candle. And they got to switch back and forth with who got to help light it. And that, that's when we would read the, the Advent um, verses and, and all of that. And that worked really well for us again, because our kids kind of held us to that. Um, and it became a really good night, nightly ritual, but our sacred space um, is in kind of our more formal room that we don't use a whole, I say formal, it's just because we don't use it a whole lot. Um, but that's where we put our Christmas tree and there's no TV, there's no toys, there's no, there's nothing in there really. Um, and that kind of becomes, we have, everyone sits on the floor and we, you know, just have the Christmas tree lights on and it's just this really quiet, um, sweet boy 
um, just this really quiet space. Um, and I'm looking forward to setting that up again this year. Thank you. Marjorie, would you add anything? Um, I think we did not have a successful Advent practice last year. And, you know, some, and of course my children are a lot older, but, um, you know, some years you really knock it out of the park and some years you don't, but we're in a new house this year. And so there's a lot of conversation about what are things going to look like? Like, where's the Christmas tree going to go? And where do we, you know, we don't even eat the same way. Like we used to eat at the bar and now we eat at the table. So I feel like we have a real opportunity to be intentional. Um, and because my children and I, well, pre-COVID, didn't necessarily worship together, I think Sunday evening is sort of a special time for us now because we are typically home um, together at night um, because youth group is a different thing now. So I don't know. I'm excited, and I think I'm looking forward to establishing the newness. A new ritual. Yeah. Rituals, yeah. So Advent too becomes the the thought about peace, and uh, when you when the in the lighting of the uh, Advent candles, it, the question is, what does it mean to have peace in your heart, and how do you share peace in the world? Um, and this is these are the the texts for this week are John the Baptist. You know, here's this man shouting in the crazy looking dude in the wilderness shouting, prepare a way for the Lord. Um, and we've put, we've aligned peace with that Sunday. So the only connection I have to an Advent practice was from one of my previous colleagues, uh, Casey Thompson at Idlewild, who suggested in a sermon one Sunday that we should have John the Baptist on the top of the Christmas tree instead of stars and angels. And John the Baptist should be, should have a motorized voice that's um, shouting at us, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, so, um, so what we, what we have I made Casey, uh, John the Baptist to put on the top of his Christmas tree. And then we have made one for our Christmas tree. So that, that might be the only Advent practice our children might remember is the John the Baptist on the top of the tree. And some people look at it and go, cause it's just a mix of found objects that I've picked up off the street while running and then kind of glued together with some purple. And uh, some people look at it and go, what is that junk on the top of your tree? <laughs> but it's, it really, I mean, it has, so that's a way to kind of teach a story of the Bible. I, I wonder if our, if and when we have grandchildren, if that's what they'll, you know, that's a way to teach them about what it means to prepare for the, as we're waiting for Christ's arrival, you know, there was this man in the Bible and anyway, so John the Baptist, in case anybody wants a John the Baptist tree topper, just Hook me up. I don't think you can find one at Target, but I'd be happy to put some work together for y'all. How are how are y'all tying John the Baptist to peace, though? I, I, it's going to be a good question, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> I mean, if I, I mean, because Christ's advent into this world brings preparing for Christ in our hearts brings a peace into this world like no other. So that's, that's the, that's the, I mean, that's the, that is the connection. But you have a locust eating crazy man shouting at people, prepare the way of the Lord. So it doesn't necessarily feel like it goes together, but it does. So I'm thinking like when you put, this is, oh, I'm borrowing all this from Tracy Smith. When you put your tree up, you know, Megan, I can imagine that front room and your tree and when you put it in and, you know, you plug the lights in for the first time, what would it look like to offer a blessing? I don't know about y'all, but when you work in the church and trying to get the darn tootin' tree up and then, or getting the darn tootin' tree down, I, it does not become anything that feels much like a blessing in our household. Um, and I learned this when Mimi McDougal invited our Abigail over one day to help because her kids were grown and out and invited Abigail over to help decorate her tree. And Abigail came home and was like, 
and I saw pictures of Robin and Clifton when they were babies and I got to hang them on the tree and I heard these stories about them. I'm like okay I'm the slacker mother you know I'm like just hang the damn ornaments on the tree um so I wonder what it looks like when we put if we put trees up if we ask a blessing as we, uh, that becomes a family activity that we do together, but we ask a blessing as you decorate it, um, that, you know, it can be a symbol of joy. Um, I remember Abigail's first Christmas was in this house, the house that we live in. And when we came down this, when we brought her down the stairs and she saw the Christmas tree with the lights on it for the first time, like that wonder on her face, um, cause it was in the front hallway. I can remember, like, I remember her experiencing that wonder in a new way that first time, but, you know, to talk about branches, um, that remind us of God's shelter and shade, um, a trunk that reminds us of God's strength, um, the lights that might bring peace. There's your peace for week two, decorating your tree in week two. Um, um, Oop, hold on a second. Um, I can't see what I have down here. Oh, and remembering the gift, remembering the gift that God brings us, because I don't know if you put your gifts under your tree, but God brings us the gift of Jesus. Um, some of the, th I, you know, I said we didn't have many rituals, but with our older kids, we always cut live trees down. We went and did that cutting a tree down together. And when they sawed off the end of the tree, we would keep that little piece and we made that into an ornament so our tree has some pieces of um, circles of wood from trees across the years that we've had Jim just like drilled a hole in it and just put a little piece of yarn in it and we dated the put the year on it and hang it on the tree and back in the day when we had our older kids of course we had them in their smocked outfits and we took all the perfect pictures and mm -mm, poor Abigail never got any of that um but I do when I when I pull those ornaments of the tree out and hang them on the tree, there's something about the memory of doing of you know getting in the car and picking a tree together that is um, those are good memories that I carry forward. And trees, you know, to be able to go outside and look at the trees and talk about the strength of trunks or whatever. Those trees are great metaphors to talk about God's providence in our lives um, in terms of how a canopy covers you and roots under the earth. So I don't know. I wonder about all that to say week two, I wonder about a Christmas tree blessing. Anybody have that, any kind of practice there? We don't have a blessing practice, but we have, um, we have a tree practice. So we actually have three trees. We use artificial trees because um, of Reed and I both have hay fever that we just can't get a legitimate tree. Tree. <laughs> yeah so we use the the fake trees but we have the really big one and then we have kind of a medium-sized one and we have a small one we don't always put up the small one i don't know that we did last year but the big one is the pretty tree it's the and i'm thinking about this now as i'm reading this it's the tree of peace mm -hmm. it's the one that has to be decorated just right <laughs> with the proper colors and the proper ornaments in the proper places and then there's the medium-sized tree that goes in the playroom and it's appropriately decorated. It's just this mishmash of, mishmash of everything. All kinds of, and they get, it's the, it's the tree the of kids chaos. get to decorate that however they want and they love it. No judgment, no judgment, right? <laughs> yeah. But and it's, where would the, it's the tree, tree of joy. It's the tree of joy, right? Yeah because uh -huh. they, they do whatever they want with it. And it often has things that they've just cut out and then just like, let's try to find something that approximates a hook and hang it on the tree, uh, you know? And then, then the small tree, which sometimes gets put up, sometimes doesn't, I don't know. Um, but it can kind of be a little bit of both. It can be the pretty tree or it can be the tree of hope. So, I wonder if we can be intentional about how we, because we decorate them the way we do, we've already got this quasi tradition about how we decorate them. If we can just be intentional about um, thinking about what it means to decorate it the way it 
the way we do when we mm -hmm. decorate. Has anybody strung popcorn with your kids? That's the other place like to do popcorn garlands for a tree. Also lost my patience there. Just so you know, that was kind of hard. <laughs> like not for young children. Just do you do say. it with a needle? How do you do it? Like a crochet needle. So it's kind of like a dull needle. Yeah. I strung was, cranberries and popcorn once with my family. Don't string, don't try to string cranberries. <laughs> it looks like you wear the red all over everything. Well, you they're really hard. <laughs> it's hard to string a cranberry. <laughs> okay, y'all, don't try to string cranberries. We've learned that tonight. <laughs> Any other Christmas tree traditions or anything? I was thinking my um, our tree is like super, super chaotic. And a couple of years ago, I was noticing Dylan, who, you know, had to be two years ago. Wait, so he's five. He was three, I guess. Anyway, I was letting him climb up on our two step step stool and just hang whatever he wanted, however he wanted. And like easily more than a dozen ornaments broke. But the the happiness of it was like so legit, you know, and I was not bothered by the breaking of the ornaments. I think mostly because I have a mother in law who never lets us run short on or Christmas ornaments. But it was just so good and fun and and wholesome and messy and I think I have a relatively high tolerance of messy but I think that kids see the Christmas tree um with an extra layer of magic in it already um and and so I think trying to talk to them about that stuff is is already kind of eye-catching and exciting you know the the experience has them in this kind of you know vibrating state already <laughs> suspended wonder yeah yeah you just grab it i think mm. Um, so it's interesting when you use the language, Emily, of, um, why is my computer not doing this? Y'all, I don't know what's going on. Uh, Advent three is joy. So joy. Um, you know, Emily, when you're talking about just that moment of I got to do this and it's like the suspended wonder and you, you described happiness but I wonder what how you might um what's what's the difference between joy and happiness Not everybody at once. Did y'all read that book by the Dalai Lama and the, uh, who was it? The Bishop? Tutu? Yeah, Desmond Tutu. Yeah. And it was about that. It was about joy. The Book of Joy is what it was called. Uh, but it's, it's basically that happiness is conditional. Uh, and joy is something different that you have, whether you're happy or not. Maybe happiness is short lived and joy is long lasting. Mm -hmm. I thought yeah. about it the same way, Whitney. Joy is something that fills you, it permeates you. It, it, deeper. It's deeper. It guides everything you do. Happiness is fleeting. Um, happiness is great. I'm not saying it's not. Happiness is wonderful, but it's it's fleeting. So how do you sow joy? I think 
think in our household, a lot of it, a lot of the joy that our kids have is based on us just <laughs> relaxing and helping to kind of foster those moments um, and not getting upset or flustered by like I'm just imagining like Emily's like a dozen ornaments and glass everywhere and all of that like sometimes <laughs> those moments, like I feel like as parents we steal those moments of joy um for our kids by worrying about the small things so I grew up and um my family was from Pittsburgh and my grandmother was very crafty and she had she had several trees kind of like the uh, Jeremy y'all you described but we they she had all like perfect trees like there was the white tree that had the snow on it and there was the pink tree that had the velvet ribbons on it and then you know there was an and they were all um, not real trees but she had a particular tree that um she made these ornaments and they had I mean they are I can't even describe them to you but <clears throat> they were not to be touched and um, they were that, you know, don't touch it. It's, you know, you got to stay away from grandma's tree. But um, last year we moved my aunt, her daughter, the last remaining relative in Pittsburgh out of her home. And my aunt had all those ornaments in boxes just tucked away. She did, my aunt was older and didn't even get them out anymore. And so she's like, well, I guess you can have them. And so for Christmas last year, we just, the family, all, we just put them all out in the dining room table and everybody, you know, the kids all just came and took them. So they are no longer the perfect tree all on one tree, but they, they've gone, you know, they've, they've been shared with the family. So, so our, you know, our kid, you know, our kids have them, the cousins have them, they all, this is the cat who has decided wants to be in my lap right now. Um, that's, you know, and that feels very meaningful for me in some ways when I think about sowing joy to know that there was a way that these were exclusive in one time they were set apart from young children's hands but that my grandmother made them and we get to carry those into into a new generation feels like a way of faith formation and um, that feels like it's sowing something that is has a permanence to it that's lasting somewhat in the, the memory of the people that are attached. Um, so the other thing, and um, you know, I can look at, I'm, I look at y'all and I think about, this has not been an easy year for lots of different reasons. Many of you have experienced the, you know, the loss of a grandparent or the loss of a, a parent and a grandparent, um, just so much. And so what do you do when um, everything isn't rosy, happy, happy, joy, joy, you've got loss that you're looking at um, as you approach Advent um, or you just feel absolutely kind of crazy. I don't know, may, I, maybe y'all don't feel this way but there are days when I just feel like I need to be grounded. And I did, um, I did a workshop with a woman who leads the in, in, Enneagram workshop. Do y'all know what Enneagram is? Do y'all have some awareness of the Enneagram? And so um, one of the things that she suggested to us, I'm an eight on the Enneagram, was um, this practice of pause. Do, do y'all know this practice? Have y'all heard about this practice? I'm just laughing at you being an eight. <laughs> Okay, well, you can keep laughing. I don't like it when I can't hear your laughter. That's what's not funny because I can see your face, but I don't know what that means. Oh, now Jenna is throwing her head back in laughter. I think y'all need to unmute so I can hear. Jenna's asking what an eight is. I am not explaining it right now. I will later. <laughs> Being right. an eight in my family is something to be proud of. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway. That this she said this practice which I've thrown this is not coming from the Advent book that I've been drawing on but it's the practice of a pause and it's a really just so P is for being present 
So like literally like, like a mindfulness of where you are, particularly when you have the self-awareness, like you are just like, yeah, it's out of crate. It either feels crazy, like hard to be present, or it just feels so overtly emotional, like maybe it's grief. And so, so the P is for just being present to what, where you are. The A is just allow the emotion that you're, you're feeling in that moment, whether it's a craziness, whether it's grief, whatever that is, but just notice, allow it and notice where it kind of, where you feel it in your body. And then the U from pause is just kind of try to understand that, um, you know, is it a shortness of breath? Is it an achiness or is it, you know, is it a, you know, an overwhelmingness that kind of catches you like in your throat, like I'm like a sob, whatever that is, but just understand what that is, what that emotion is. Just be curious about it. And then really the S is sense, like sense where it is in your body. Um, where is this? Where is this? And then the E is engage in compassion with yourself. And um, I was sharing this with uh, Sarah and she is reading some parenting book right now just because of where Nicholas is in his life. And she has had to turn to the books is what she, how she kind of describes it. And um, one of the things uh, that she got, one of those practices that she got out of that, uh, this book was that you know, kids like have to move so things don't get stuck in their bodies. So we see kids moving all over the place. But one of the techniques in this book was like when, um, when Nicholas is just like, no, 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 she does this like, let's breathe, like breathe in and breathe out. And she said he completely gets distracted from whatever that is with the the really taking in a deep breath, but it's like somatic. It literally changes his body by doing that breathing. So it just makes me mindful that when this, when Advent, the reality of the world that we live in, and I wonder about this year because it's so different for those who may be isolated from their families. Um, I don't know if it'll, you know, what the emotions will be, but I wonder about the just practicing pause and how do we teach that to our children, but also how do we practice it ourselves? So just present. So um, I really don't understand why my slideshow is not moving forward. Jeremy, I need you. Did you plug your device in? <laughs> Have you shut it down recently? Okay. And then the fourth week is, and I love this one, waiting and wonder we're not alone. You know, how do we teach our children that God is always with us? God is always present. And how do we show that love that God has for us? How do we show it with one another? And how do we share it and show it to the world? Um, And, you know, I think about the practices like, you know, go to the old, when I was growing up at Balmoral, we would go to the, um, the old folks home and sing Christmas carols, you know, and that was just, that was fun to do. We did that as a church youth group. We can't do that this year. Do you know, how do you share love in a season of pandemic? Um, how do you, how do you do that? I think about the parking lot, um, with Jeremy and Ben in the mornings. Uh, those Wednesday mornings, that feels like that's some practice of love. Um, do you talk to your children about what you're doing on those mornings? What do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, we're, we, I think I mean, it feels like an eternity ago, but the kids are really familiar with more than a meal and, um, and that, that practice. So they understand it's like that. Um, you know, they understand I, I, I'm, you know, gone when they wake up, I get, try to get back before they go to school. But um, yeah, I mean, they know that we're helping people who need food and, and, and you know, it doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. Um, I, don't, I don't explain to them the, uh, the propaganda flyers that show up every now and then, but 
<laughs> I've got one in the car if you'd like it. I could make your John the Baptist out of it. Mm. I brought one home and it was, it disappeared. <laughs> I, I was trying to keep it as a souvenir and it's gone. I don't know what happened. Maybe Jenna knows found that its one. Way into the trash. Anyway, <laughs> we have talked about it with our kids and we had to start way back. Okay, so people need food because, and particularly right now because, therefore our church is helping in this way. And daddy goes on Wednesday mornings or early before you guys get up, um, sometimes before you guys get up. Uh, to do this because so they understand um god bless her eden told me the other day can we give them more is there uh, more we can give um and you know that that, <laughs> that was that was something that was special um so they they get it yeah you know, hold the intention a child that says, is there more that we can give? And the police who were driving backwards up Union Avenue saying, the church is out of food. Turn around. The church is out of food. You know, it's like, oh, that's just a, that's a hard tension. And yet that's why we have these practices and why we want to celebrate, I mean, why we want to be intentional with how we think about Christ in breaking in the world, you know, light and darkness. Like one of the things that, so for, for Christmas Eve, the children's service is going to be all virtual. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen with the five o'clock service, but the, the 10 o'clock service or the, what has traditionally been the communion service in the sanctuary. And we, celebrate communion and light candles and stand in a circle and sing silent night we're going to do that in the parking lot this year it's going to be a little bit different but when you think about being in an urban in an urban environment and i mean a little unpredictable but in the night and then lighting candles in that space and talking about the light of the world in which no darkness can overcome in this year that we've had. I just, I think that is gonna be a profound moment. Um, and the, and you know, using the prologue from the gospel of John, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, that, and that whole, prologue leads into about a light that no darkness can overcome. So I'm excited about that service in particular, um, cause it's going to be something that we've never done before. Um, and I think it will resonate. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, what does it mean to not be, and, you know, you think about what we, what, how the parking lot has become one of our greatest we raised what nine million dollars for a renovation of the Jones Building, and our primary, well, one of our largest assets is the parking lot. By the way, which was paved in 1965 when we took down some houses. Been reading some session minutes, just so you know. That's when we got that parking lot. Um, I am so frustrated with this. Oh, puppets, Marjorie, help us understand how we use the puppets, which were in your packet from the Advent Crafts. Oh, I wish I had my photo album handy because what appealed to me about this so much is when I graduated from college, my mother gave me a crash and a nativity set, and it must have been the thing in the 90s because lots of people have them. They're like the molded figures and you, you know, it's a collection. So she could give it to me for Christmas every year, another piece. But <clears throat> anyway, when um, Reese Chancellor wasn't, he was to, to no, anyway, it doesn't matter. Reese was not quite maybe 15 months old when it was Christmas. And I had the crush on this desk in the house where we lived at the time. And it was quiet at my house. And you know, that's always means there's a problem. <laughs> when it's quiet, you need to go because there's a problem. And I found Reese playing 
with the nativity. And it wasn't that it's breakable and it wasn't, but I'm just, I'm not Emily. <laughs> it's like, no, you're messing it up. <laughs> but <laughs> like, that, no, you don't put the baby Jesus on the roof. I mean, what are you doing? But what I loved that was that he was intrigued by the nativity and he wanted to interact with it. And so I thought that the popsicle puppets would be a way for the children to interact with the story or tell the story in their own way or, you know, imagine and wonder what it was like in a physical, you know, with a tangible thing. Um, and, you know, the jewels are checking hazard and all that. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's all good. One of the one of the things that Tracy Smith suggests for older children um, with the nativity scene is like over the over the course of Advent um, in that sacred space in whatever that time or that one of your intentions could you could just pick this one intention for the whole season of Advent is that you rotate um, the figurines from the nativity and then you tell you tell the story so Jeremy would tell the story from the perspective of Mary one week. And then the next week he would tell the story from Joseph and then, you know, the sheep or the star, you know, you can make an inanimate object, have a voice, you can personify it. But um, I thought that was, that would be intriguing to see um, what came. Um, if you, you, you read the biblical story, but then you invite different tellings from different members of the family. That could be kind of fun if you have a drama led kind of family. So those are, Marjorie, what else did y'all do in the Advent crafts? You did the Advent wreath, the puppets, and is there anything that we're missing that we could share? Well, you touched on it earlier. There was a packet about the Christmas ornaments that had some descriptives about, you know, the history of the Christmas and, I mean, Anne, I'm, and of your era, because I remember that styrofoam and the gold glitter and I, very vividly. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, we had to have glitter at the event also. It was important. But, yeah, so that was the other AJ, AJ, Northrop, AJ Northrup would love having glitter. <laughs> That'd be kind of fun. All right. Well, um, thank you all for uh, entertaining uh, thinking about Advent and thank you for your faithfulness um, for the people that you are. It's really, it's, it encourages me. Um, I'm so grateful for you, I think is the way I would say it. So thank you. And thank you for showing up at eight o'clock at night um, and your presence. It's important. Before we go um, tonight, how can we pray? What do we need to be praying for? For whom and for what? It's the cat at my feet. I would say peace in the home. We need that. Mm -hmm. You want to say more? Uh, there's just been a lot of conflict lately, I think, that's a result of just being stuck together for so long it's getting to all of us mm -hmm. i was jenna i was doing premarital counseling before this tonight and um one of the exercises in premarital counseling is um it, it's this exercise where you ask yourself i want these are three things i want more of in our marriage and this is three things i want less of in our marriage and um or in our relationship, call it relationship. And um, one of them was to not be around one another all the time, <laughs> but they're both having to work from home in a, you know, in a small apartment. And I was like, I get it. So I'm hearing a similar refrain in that. But there, there's an exercise y'all can all do if you want to, three things you want more of or three things you want less of in your relationship. But uh, yeah, so more peace in the home. <laughs> What did you say, Ben? That feels dangerous. I think it's about strengthening your relationship and trusting one another to name what you need. Very long the filters don't exist. <laughs> Back to the prayers. Um, 
I just, as parents, I feel like right now, there's so many decisions to make about the smallest things and it's constantly evaluating risks. And so as we approach the holidays, trying to decide, you know, is it, is it a good decision to do this? Is it safe for this party for us to do this? And I just feel like the smallest decisions are just heavy and weighted um, right now. I'd add that there are a lot of people on this call, uh, as I look across the screen, sliding into new roles or potentially sliding into new roles soon within the church, within their personal lives. And um, I just pray for smooth transition for... Yeah, we do, don't we? Yeah, we do, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> Please, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, be our friend. Yeah. <laughs> All the things, right? Um, all the things that we like to say. I'll just leave it there. Smooth transition for all of us. I say pray for our, our children's education and their teachers and how this year will impact them for years Forever. to come. Yeah. I think we also, I'll speak for myself, that um, this has been really good for me tonight that um, I was telling Kevin while we were muted that I wasn't really planning on doing a tree this year. Not really ready for any of that. I don't want to take any of it down from the attic. Um, mm. and Emily reminded me that it's not about us. It's about the kids. And so, I love you. That's what I want to say to you. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Very hard. Mm. Y'all, it's a it's a privilege when you sit with people like uh, I can remember when Kevin and Whitney sat in my study and we did premarital counseling. I don't know if y'all did that exercise, but here we are. I mean, it's just it's a privilege to just share. So thank you. Thank you for your candor. I moved my parents out of there uh, for a for a month. The last month, we have been moving my parents out of there, the childhood home I grew up in, and they moved Sunday to Greenville, South Carolina. And I can't talk about it without crying. So, um, I would just ask for prayers, um, for peace for our family. We're taking the risk to gather in Montreat. Um, we're all getting COVID tested and having to do all that. Um, my parents have lived here for 54 years and now they are in a city where they don't know anyone except for my brother. And uh, it's disorienting. And it's hard to see your parents in that place. It's really hard. So I cry a lot these days. I would say I'm very fragile. So excuse my fragility with y'all but it's just where I am so it's a part of where I am so on that note shall we pray so I'm going to invite us to put our feet on the floor or uh, reach out to the partner that's around you if you've got a partner around you and I'm going to invite us to take another deep breath in kind of where we started and hold on to it for a minute and then let it go. And then take another breath, a deep one and hold on to it and let it go. And one more. And then let it go. The Lord before whom generations rise and pass away. For the gift of this time that you have given us to gather together tonight. You brought us here. It was your action that brought us together tonight. And I'm grateful, God. 
I'm grateful for each person and for us together. You teach us that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so I pray for your faithfulness, that we will be faithful to being your people. Lord, we stand on the cusp of a new, the new Christian year when we come to anticipate your arrival, a light that no darkness can overcome. Some days feel darker than others. And so I pray that you will give to us that glimpse of light when we need it most. I pray for peace in our homes when conflict feels like it's at the surface of everything. I pray for a sense of uh, your courage that teaches us how to navigate through that conflict, your peace, um, that passes all understanding, just a measure of that peace when we need it most. And God, for our children, all ages, what this year means uh, for their educations, for their teachers, um, for the ways that we are being shaped Uh, in ways we don't know today, but we will know later the ways we're being shaped. I pray. um, I pray that in it, you are leading us into a new way and that it will be, uh, that you will make the way clear. (laughs) For what we don't know, that you will stand behind us and kind of show us that this is the way, so walk in it so that our children's lives might not... um, and especially those children who are most um, vulnerable. I'm thinking about, um, our, this prayer is taking me to a place of thinking about immigrant children who have been separated from their parents at the border. Um, so Lord, I just pray for the most innocent among us. And then I come back to uh, this group. <laughs> And I think about the decisions we have to make about how are we going to be bound together, how we evaluate risk about how we stay safe in the midst of this COVID. Um, I know today that I had three phone calls from three congregants who have been diagnosed with COVID. Um, That's more than I've ever had in another day. And so I pray, Lord, for um, those decisions that we have to make that we're wise, that we make those decisions with integrity. Um, You know, the sign out front says, wear your mask, love your neighbor. So help us to be faithful to um, evaluating the risks that we have to make around these holiday seasons. And Lord, the other piece I know is that grief is real. Um, I know my own grief uh, in my own family, but I also think about all the transitions that are all around us. So we know that we're calling a new head of staff. And so I pray for that candidate. I pray for um, the necessary endings that come with transitions. I pray for your protection. I pray for your providence. I pray for um, your spirit to fill um, our anticipation until we meet that candidate with a great sense of joy. Um, And I pray for great new beginnings, which you are doing. I thank you for the work of our PNC And I pray for our congregation as we prepare to welcome uh, a new leader. I also pray for our staff, Lord. um, And I pray for our congregation. Just bind us together so that we are faithful to being a beacon in the night. And the cat's telling me I prayed long enough. So Lord, take this prayer and perfect it as only you can. It's in the name of Jesus, who is the light of the world, that I ask this prayer. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. Love you all a whole lot. See y'all. Appreciate it. Good night. Thank you.